story. I grew up a, a city kid in Brooklyn, a few miles from Coney Island at Decaying Amusement Park. Environmental destruction for me was more about potholes and trains covered in graffiti. But as a teenager, I lucked upon a catalog for, a, for an organization called the School for Field Studies. It took young students to sensitive ecosystems around the planet and trained us in field biology. At 17, I went with them to Alaska to study thermoregulation and harbor seals. To get to the seals, first we left Anchorage by train and traveled for 12 hours to a small village with 10 buildings built on the edge of a huge sound. Then we spent two weeks in kayaks and paddled 75 miles away from civilization to a small beach formed by a retreating glacier. We pitched our tents where no one had camped before. Across the fjord from our campsite was a huge advancing glacier. It was a giant mile long ice face, blue in color, it was blue ice. I'd never heard of that in Brooklyn. We don't have blue ice in Brooklyn. And every hour or so, a chunk of ice the size of a house would calve or break off of the glacier and land in the fjord. Safe on our beach a few miles away, we would hear what they call white thunder roar across the fjord to us. The new iceberg would make a huge splash and giant ripples, giant waves would fan out and by the time they reached us, they had luckily died down. To warm up from the freezing glacial water, the seals who lived in and around the fjord would haul out on these icebergs and sun themselves. I and my fellow students sat in a bluff for weeks looking through binoculars counting seals. We were testing our hypotheses on the seal strategies for maintaining their body heats. I can't really tell you what we found out. It's been a long time. But it was a gift, it was an unbelievable gift to be on a beach surrounded by first growth forests, orca, salmon, bald eagles, bears, otters, those harbor seals, and to know no one else had been there before. Every day was filled with awe. When I returned to Brooklyn, I was a different person, and I, I, and I plotted with my friends of taking them back to this pristine world, but it never happened. Three years later, the sound would change forever. On March 24, 1989, the Exxon Valdez crashed into a reef and poured 55 million gallons of oil into Prince William Sound, the same place I spent that summer. It was devastating to watch it, and it started my lifelong quest in environmentalism. It was all the more devastating to see it happen again three years ago in the Gulf. So what do we do? How do we respond to these disasters? And that's why I've come today to be inspired to be a student again. To be honest, when I was asked to introduce His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, I was not familiar with his writings on the environment. But lucky, luckily for Google and a quick internet search, they led me to these words, and I quote, the earth is not, the common the earth is not only the common heritage of all humankind, but also the ultimate source of life. By overexploiting its resources, we are undermining the very basis of our own life. All around, signs abound of the destruction caused by human activity and of the degradation of nature. Therefore, the protection and conservation of the earth is not a question of morality or ethics, but a question of our survival. How we respond to this challenge will affect not only this generation, but also many generations to come. And before I introduce him, I would like to read one more thing from a different tradition, from a different religion. This quote's from Pope Francis. This is what he said in his first, his first homily just two months ago. The first homily he said. The vocation of being a protector, however, is not just something involving us Christians alone. It also had a, has a prior dimension which is simply human, involving everyone. It means protecting all creation, the beauty of the created world as the book of Genesis tells us and as St. Francis of Assisi showed us. It means respecting each of God's creatures and respecting the environment in which we live. Later in the same sermon, he says, in the end, everything has been entrusted to our protection and all of us are responsible for it. Be protectors of God's gifts. Different traditions, different religions, but the same message. And for me, it's about stewardship. Let us be great stewards for the planet. It is my great honor to now welcome to the stage His Holiness the Dalai Lama, spiritual leader of the Tibetan people, escorted by Congressman Earl Blumenauer, please. Also welcome His Holiness's translator, Geshe Tubten Ginpa.
He's on his way. Sorry. I actually went over my time, so I didn't have anything else to say. I wish I was a stand-up comedian and I could entertain you, but that's about, you know, the speech is over, so that's about it. Um, uh, any questions from the audience about my new film, Noah's Ark, coming out in March 2014? <laughs> yeah. So, Noah, Noah's a new movie by Paramount Pictures and uh, Regency. It's coming out in March 2014. Stars Russell Crowe. Look out for it. In fact, it's going to be so in your face, you're going to be annoyed with me really soon. So, the ads are just beginning. So, I, I apologize in advance. Um, and uh, that wrap it up. Okay, good. So, and now, uh, here we go. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and Earl Perlhound. Good time. Sit down. <laughs> We're <clears throat> so delighted to welcome you here today. Uh, we begin with a special announcement uh, presentation. We have uh, from the Portland Trailblazers, the President Chris McGowan and the General Manager Neil O'Shea with a special presentation. With a special presentation. I'd like to present you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hmm? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Thank you.
That may be a first. <laughs> Welcome, Your Holiness, huh? ladies and gentlemen. Your Holiness, you've said that the Tibetan view of the environment is derived from the unique environment in which they live. And I think many of us here in Portland share that perspective. We are honored that you would spend so much of your time helping us in Oregon reflect on what we've done, where we are, and what we can do together. We understand that a livable, healthy environment is the starting place of success and happiness. And we can think of no better place for His Holiness the Dalai Lama to share his views on the correlation between peace and the environment. What makes the Dalai Lama's approach to the environment special is that he is a man both of faith and of science. Let me say that again a man of faith, and a man of science. Wouldn't that be something greatly appreciated in our government? His approach of exploring, embracing, and promoting science of all disciplines is extraordinary and it is inspiring. In his many years as a spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama has promoted the connection between faith and the environment, a concept that is not uniquely Buddhist. The Jews call it renewing the world. Christians and Muslims call it stewardship of the earth. The Hindus, devotion to good of all things. Well, that connection between the community of faith, uh, I think, can spark the environmental awareness that uh, has become too political and distracted. The Dalai Lama lives and promotes this idea wedding Buddhist tenets with scientific fact to create a powerful case for environmental protection. While there are many problems that need to be fixed around the globe, there are all these things that we can do as individuals. And we look forward, Your Holiness, to your thoughts and inspiration. Because he does so with a special, unique grace, thoughtfulness, and as we've seen, good humor. I watched His Holiness when we presented the Congressional Medal of Honor bring together Speaker Pelosi and President Bush in a spirit of good feeling. Well, His Holiness has, may, has received many special gifts, the Nobel Prize, the Congressional Medal of Honor, the Trailblazer Jersey. <laughs> I'm pretty certain that he may not have one of our spe special Congressional bicycle pins, which I would like to add as a token of our reverence, support, and in the spirit of bike partisanship, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to introduce His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Mm. I think put her somewhere. Thank you. I want to hear some of the things, I think from here. Brothers and sisters, indeed I am very happy uh, with you and share some of my own 
sort of experience and thought, and also afterward, through question and answer, I also as you can learn. learn something from you. And sometimes the unexpected questions very helpful to think more. So human mind Human mind needs that kind of prov you know provoking through interaction. <coughs> So the organizer who arranged this, uh, I very much appreciate. Thank you. And then, then also the jersey. Oh, <laughs> and this hat. That no use. <laughs> this. Very helpful. <laughs> that this symbol of cycle, perhaps if I have enough time, more cycle may be helpful for my niece. <laughs> I think I did some exercise, you see, that way, like that. <clears throat> now last, I think two, three days, here, as I talk much about environment. It is really, I think, serious sort of matter. Uh, and indeed, I'm very happy the Portland city is a use, pay special attention about that. And in fact, I learned some foreign countries, the, uh, some delegation visit here to learn from your own experience. It's really wonderful, really wonderful. <clears throat> then this morning we already discuss about environment, mainly environment issue. Now, here afternoon my talk, uh, mainly the compassion. Compassion means the genuine sense of concern of others' well-being, which overcome others' suffering. Kindness, wish, um, loving kindness is the wish for others to be happy. Mm. So the sense of concern of others' well-being. Uh, is so important. Therefore, all world major religions, everyone, you see, the, the main sort of message, main practice is love, compassion. And obviously, in our mind, so sometimes quite often, this is an obstacle we met, obstacle, then or threat, then anger. Uh, once we develop anger, uh, and then the, the traces of that anger sometimes remain a bit long. So, for special counter for that, tolerance and forgiveness. So, in order to further nurture or protect 
practice of compassion. We need practice of tolerance and practice of forgiveness. So all main sort of focus is practice of love, compassion. So the all major religious tradition, she talks uh, these values. These are fundamental sort of value of not only human being, but also many other mammals. Now here, mainly biological factor. So religions then use different philosophy to strengthening that biological factor of these values, quality. So, and so therefore, you see, all major religious tradition, if we examine and also watch those serious practitioners, we will find more or less sort of same sort of quality. N number of uh, Christian brothers, sisters, and also um, Islam practitioner, the Hindu as well. Uh, see, they really totally dedicate their life serving to other, particularly poorer section of people. So their sort of inner strength come from their own religious tradition. So all major religious tradition have same potential to produce such wonderful, dedicated people. So, so, so long, people who follow this different tradition be serious, sincere. Then, all religions have the same potential. But unfortunately, in many cases, religious message or religious practice is simply lip service. <coughs> Talking love, compassion, doing something different. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes I sit telling people, unless you really pay seriousness about religious sort of practice or religious message, sometimes religion teach us the how to act hypocrisy, saying very nice thing. Uh, in real life, not much concern. And among religious people, uh, a lot of sort of corrupted people there. If these people truly committed their own sort of faith, sincerely, then impossible such corruption things to happen. So, if you see any person who really believes one's own tradition sincerely, seriously, then all traditions really very useful, very helpful. One thing. Then, next question. Uh, and to those people who have not much interest about religion, A people who claim non-believer. Yes? Okay. But recently I saw one report on newspaper. Uh, out of seven billion human beings, one billion, over one billion, uh, formally consider non-believer. So these non-believer, also part of humanity. Uh, in order to carry a sensible sort of life, they also need practice of compassion. Uh, and they themselves, in order to become more happy person, happy person, 
Again, the practice of compassion is very relevant. So, people should not consider uh, the subject like compassion, forgiveness, these things are religious matter. matter. So those people who have not much interest about religion, then they completely neglect about these values, is wrong. Whether you accept religion or not, that's up to individual. I think it is quite true. Uh, without, okay. Now for the time being, I think okay. The waiting room, quite cold. Now here, quite warm. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, we can see among non-believers, some people really dedicated their life, uh, their life, their life for serving other people. So, therefore, uh, be compassionate person, not necessarily a religious believer. It seems, you see, compassion, affection, these are biological factors. Everybody, after we born, one's own mother really uh, give us affection. That is necessary. You see, such sort of enthusiasm, such sort of will to, sort of the, to, sort of the, to, to take care. I think sometimes I mentioned one occasion from I think from Japan to America, long flight. Uh, one couple with two children. Uh, they, uh, at the initial, when we take off, take off, the both parents taking care about the two children. The two children. One children, one child, quite small, most cases sleep. The, the other one, quite sort of, sort of too, was it? quite active. Quite active. <laughs> Around here and there like that. So it initially, both parents look after, look after him. Then, late night, around midnight, the father <laughs> just <as> he slept. <laughs> the mother still, you see, taking care. The next morning, when we about landing, I think West Coast, somewhere, I think, uh, San Francisco, somewhere, I noticed mother's eye become red and clear sign of tiredness. So, taking care, that quite uh, active, naughty. Oh, quite active. Uh, naughty. Oh, naughty, you see, <laughs> naughty boy. Not easy. <laughs> so, such sort of, also the enthusiasm, oh, even sacrifice her own sleep. You see? Motivation, there must be some motivation. That's sense of affection. So, those mammals, after birth, at least some period, without others' affection, without others' sort of care, 
cannot survive. Therefore, biologically, we equipped the sense of sort of affection. That brings energy. That brings tireless sort of effort. So that's a biological system. Clear. So for our own sort of survival, affection is very, very important. I think the mistake is when we are young, the, the sort of feeling or experience of others' affection is very sort of fresh. Ah, fresh. Very fresh. Then gradually grown up uh, and some education. Then eventually you feel some kind of independence. No need. Others help. Others affection. Then you yourself also you still forget affection, neglect about affection. Then with combination of our greed, our desire, and human intelligence, then we become more aggressive. So that's a mistake. Potential there. Uh, but then it dormant. The other sort of experience, more aggressiveness, or these things, or self-centered attitude, then become more dominant. And sometimes in the society, you see this, those people who really practice compassion, sense of care for other, and not sort of offensive, easily. And sometimes people consider these are weak people. So immediately they react strongly. The people feel, oh, it is very good. I think these are the, the causes, eventually grown up, forgetting this basic our value. So, my point is, point is this human affection is a biological factor, not come from religious, religious tradition. Religious tradition, religious teaching, simply backing this basic uh, value, which is a uh, biological factor. And different religious traditions use different philosophical views. The theistic religion of God. God is creator. We all are uh, created by God. So that's a very powerful sort of method to increase love. One of my Muslim friend, he told me, he told at one big gathering, gathering. he told uh, Islam practitioner must extend love towards entire Allah's creature. In us, creation, like that. <clears throat> so, all religious traditions use their philosophical, different philosophical views to increase or to nurture these basic values. Then, non theistic, such as Jainism and Buddhism, we believe. Our concept is law of causality. So here, the theory of karma. Karma means action. So action and result, action and result. So our experience uh, due to our own action. So any action which harm other uh, result, you will suffer, you get. Consequences, negative consequences. If you carry any action which brings some sort of happiness, some sort of pleasure, some satisfaction to other, that action result positive. So you get benefit. 
So anyone want happy life, do not want suffering. So suffering very much related with harmful action. Satisfaction, happy experience, very much related with uh, helping others, action, any action which helping others. So use the, that kind of philosophy, that kind of concept, again strengthening practice of love. Clear. So therefore, all misery tradition see, carry the same message. So that is the basis of unity, harmony among different institutions. Different philosophy is necessary in order to satisfy uh, the people uh, with different mental disposition. Clear. Now I would like to share this one, this one, one, one point. Then. As I mentioned earlier, a non-believer, there's no point to neglect upon these values. Now here, those this morning also is to be touched, the materialistic life. We, uh, we, we, we have some kind of culture or because of the, because of combat. Uh, habit. Oh. That happy life, if you have better material facility, your life becomes much happier. Yes, in physical level, yes, uh, the comfortable house, comfortable house, such with the hand. Um, um, cushions, lamp. No cushions like that, more comfortable. Then lay down on a rock or solid sort of place much sort of comfortable in these facilities. So physical level and music, nice sort of as there. Music. Uh, night, uh, sound. Uh, sound, get some pleasure. And seeing something nice, you see, you get some pleasure. And taste, as I mentioned this morning. So these are we simply sort of as we carry our life on a very superficial level. This morning I mentioned those people who simply you see, consider external values are the ultimate source of joyful life. Then actually these people's thinking are like animals. Animals just like that. But we, human beings, our real sort of the deeper satisfaction or joyfulness, not relying on sensorial experiences. For example, faith, not depend on sensorial experiences, but mental experience. Then, then affection. Limited affection or compassion, even animal also have. That's those biological factor sort of affection. That is spontaneous and very limited. What we want, you see, unbiased love. The limited love that is biased only towards your friend. Never extend your enemy side or even neutral people. Now, through training, through use reasons, we can extend the biased, limited compassion up to unbiased, infinite compassion. That only we human beings can do, not animal. So these things really, I think, unique human ability. Just so this is some kind of deep peace of mind, deep satisfaction or joyfulness through these 
level is the real unique human beings kasota quality no? uh, quality so therefore uh, lifestyle just the thinking material value forget or neglect about our inner sort of the inner world inner value uh, you will never be a happy person only temporarily I think you buy one beautiful new car. Yes, next is a few days, few weeks, maybe you really, really feel very happy. And I think even your dream may dream the car, that car. <laughs> <laughs> Then one month or six months, your neighbor acquired another new car. then you feel your own car now looks very bad <laughs> oh <laughs> get it away get it off you see that ugly car want to that new one like that and as a result some of my friend really uh, very rich very wealthy family No, not working. Yeah. Then pass, perhaps rest. Then I'm not going to do it. Oh, yes. Uh, I wish another bang. <laughs> oh, not working. No, no, no. Loud speaker, not. Not working. Okay. C- can you hear me? No. technicians there what happened what happened huh problem is Can it repair? Yes, sir. Go, 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 go. So, uh, what point? Oh, I 
So the, I think the real source of lasting joyfulness through peace of mind is on mental level, not sensorial level. So I, I mentioned, you see, the, the one of my sort of friend, uh, very rich, I think the uh, Very rich, but as a person, very unhappy person. Too much stress, too much anxiety, and loneliness in deep inside. You see, that kind of sort of difficulties uh, cannot remove by money, by power. Sometimes money brings more worry, more anxiety. Uh, and power also. Too much suspicion, too much distrust. So result, the person, 24 hours, anxiety. Too much ex sorry, sorry, stress. Then even physical level, that kind of mental state eventually ruin your physical health. So these days, we usually say, in order to get healthy physical, we need healthy mind. And also I sort of, now these days, I'm telling, now these, as a result of Serious discussion, years, years, with uh, modern scientists and medical, medical scientists and also brain specialists uh, and also educationists. You see, uh, so we, we so, so I usually call hygiene of physical. Uh, similarly, hygiene of emotion. We should take as much as we care about our mental state, as much our physical body. That's very essential. So therefore, material value, yes, it is useful but should not sort of trust or your own hope put on material value. Should not do that. Whether believe religion or not, that is a different question. Uh, however, you should not neglect about these inner human values. Without religious faith, we can train. Already some scientists some university already carry uh, some experiment. Result, quite convincing. So actually we are working how to introduce in modern education system or secular education field uh, some education or some teaching where about uh, training, training about our mind, from kindergarten up to university level. We are working. So the main point uh, which I'm now aiming is uh, you should not consider uh, material value gives you complete satisfaction. This is wrong. Material value, they are. But equally, even more important, the internal value, such as human affection, you must understand that. And that also not necessarily be religious-minded. Through training, we can 
strengthening these values. That I would like to, to tell you. And usually you see that uh, according Indian tradition, Indian understanding, we call these values are uh, since not related, not casually, not based on religion, so we call secular ethics. Now secular, the very word secular, some of my friend uh, consider, you see, the secular, word secular is some uh, negative towards religion. That is totally wrong, according to Indian understanding. Uh, according to Indian understanding, secular means respect all religions, not preference in this religion or that religion. But also, also secular means respect non-believer. So it is something very, very relevant. And then if we think, uh, or say the more deeper way, look, French Revolution, and then also, you see, Bolshevik Revolution, you see, there is some kind of sort of tendency against religion. This is actually not religion itself, but religious institution. Quite clear. Religion, what is religion? It's promoting these basic human value. Who will be against these things? Unless drunk, otherwise, they, nobody can against mother's affection. How? No, never. But religious institution, quite often corrupted. And those who see uh, French Revolution or Bolshevik Revolution, uh, the elite were the oh, sorry, ruling ruling class or ruling sort of people corrupted, too much exploit, exploitation, too much bully, too much injustice. So these ruling class supported or backed by religious institution. So naturally, in order to break through that existing sort of system, you need willpower even against the religious institution. It's necessary. Otherwise, you see, people, oh, the government level, very bad, but they, sort of, the, blessed by God or something. Then, discourage. So, therefore, uh, I think against religious institution is very logical. Institution originally, I think the sound basis. But eventually, institution itself also corrupted. I often used to criticize some Tibetan Buddhist institution. As an institution, sometimes a little bit corrupt. So I always make, point out, these are wrong. We have to recognize this wrongdoing, we must change, we must improve. So, against religious institution, I'm a religious person, if institution corrupted, then I have to against them. This is like that, so therefore, we must make distinction uh, against religious, I mean those historically, some sort of because negative opposition towards religion is essentially not religious sort of real practice, but religious institution. So in any way, Indian understanding about secularism is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, not at all against religion. India's constitution itself based on secular concept. So if secular is against, then Indian constitution must consider as against religion. No. India, I think today, India is the only country where all major world religious traditions live together. Beside homegrown religion, 
all major religion, Zorazuddin from ancient Iran, uh, then Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all these religions come from outside, come from outside, but deeply rooted in India. So, beside homegrown religion, religion come from outside. All these major religions. Now, today, uh, all world major religions live together. So, therefore, uh, the constitution based on secularism doesn't, because of that, uh, never sort of, sort of against religion like that. So, uh, so now, uh, the conclusion, compassion is the key factor, or sense of concern of others' well-being is the key factor for one's own well-being. The systems such, we are social animals. Even some other mammals, you see, more uh, compassionate, always create some kind of peace around that, that animal. So like dog, those dog, more general, in spite of big physical, but general, then all, all dogs is, uh, surround that, around that, come together, live together, sleep together. Those dogs, always barking, often remain lonely, clear. Uh, then, uh, we human beings, those people who are very gentle, sincerely gentle, not diplomatic gentle, <laughs> sincerely sort of gentle, then the old neighbors, whenever they have free time, come together, come to that place and talk. And also, you see, neighbor, you see, feel, whenever they feel some difficulties, then happy approach to that person and share their problem. If, you see, there's a rich person, rich family, I don't think rich, rich person without these values will not happen, that kind of thing. So, this is how common. If, you, if, you, if we use common sense, look, judge your neighbor. Those family who have more compassionate attitude, much more happier, more genuine friends. I think uh, people may be very poor. Every neighbor, all the neighbors really consider that person is really compassionate, really gentle person, then that person, when passed away, then all neighbor who knows that person really feel very sad. Then another person, another family, very rich, very powerful, uh, but every sort of neighbor, a little bit fear, a little bit sort of distant. That, distant. Uh, maybe when they meet, when they met, smile or uh, express some nice words, but re real insight, uh, not much sort of was very happy. Then that person, when that person passed away, then everybody feel very happy. Now that real troublemaker now no longer with us. Very good. Recently, about I think about a few years ago, I met some Cuban refugee very religious minded. Uh, then they told me, they often pray to God, please, Fidel Castro, bring to heaven as soon as the better. <laughs> I think it is nice, you see, not something bad sort of expression, uh, bring to heaven, but at least no longer on, on human community. <laughs> so like that. So therefore, you see, uh, friend, judging 
see, that sort of factor, we can conclude, ah, human infection, uh, really ultimate source bring friends, friendship. It is quite logical. See, affection there, sense of concern is there. Automatically, uh, no room uh, harming people or cheating people or lying people or exploit other people because you really have sense of concern of their well-being. So that kind of sort of motivation there and all these negative human activities automatically is reduced. And that person automatically gain self-confidence, inner strength. With that, carry your activities transparently and speak truthfully, honestly, and then can be transparent. That brings trust. Trust brings friendship. So we are social animals. Friend is very, very important. Now, how to make a friend? We cannot buy, mo buy money or power, only through affection. So now, the scientific finding also, constant anger, constant fear, hatred, actually eating our immune system. Other hand, more compassionate mind, compassionate feeling, sustain our immune system, sometimes increasing. So therefore, you see, look these sort of different fields, and then also our common experience. I always is mentioning. Now here, I think about ten thousand people here. Outwardly, everybody very smart. But a deep insight, those individuals who received maximum affection when you are young, young age, right? early age, early age, such people, deep insight, much happier. Confidence, more stronger. Then those people who early life received less affection from your friend, or some cases, abuse. Then whole life, some kind of sense of insecurity. That brings suspicion. Remain whole life. So we all received, let's say, the affection from our mother. We, everybody, you see, have the experience sucking red, receiving mother's milk. Oh, wonderful. Oh, recently, in Delhi, uh, we have one, or the, I think international, oh, conference, I think. Not a big sort of, uh, sort of people, many people. Uh, they are speaker, one wonderful Muslim, I know him, one old one, a wonderful person. And then the Christian, regarding Christianity, the Bishop Tutu's daughter there. Then myself as a Buddhist. Then Hindu, my, since 56, we become friend. That's the uh, daughter Karen Singh. He speaks on behalf of Hinduism. When my sort of turn, I talk of these things and common experience these things. Then I tease uh, Dr. Garen Singh as his, of course, longtime friend. So you, one prince of big kingdom, big uh, uh, raja, big raja. I, one villagers boy, 
But as far as was it intimacy with mother and taking mother's milk, I think I'm more fortunate. <laughs> the Raja's king sort of son, I think the queen may not give much her milk. <laughs> I think let other people take care. And I don't think, you see, queen carry her son on shoulder. My case, is my, my mother, when she sort of uh, works in field or milking with animal, I always used to carry on her sh shoulder. So I think from that viewpoint, I come from poor peasant, I think more fortunate. <laughs> I tease him, and he laugh like that. <laughs> so this is our sort of common, common experience. So judging these things, common experience, and use common sense, then scientific finding. We can educate. We can develop firm conviction. Warm-heartedness is the key factor for happy life. Now that I want to share with you. Thank you. Now some question, question answer. Thank you, Your Holiness. Now, how to manage? Huh? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for such inspiring words. Uh, we have some questions prepared uh, from the audience. I'm happy to be accompanied by Anthony and his son. <laughs> Anthony, too. Anthony Jr. Yeah, Everly. 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 Uh, from the Red Hot Chili Peppers to ask him. Okay. So starting. Okay. Nice to see you, Your Holiness. We have a question from Roger um, out of Vancouver, Washington, who's asking, how may we best assist His Holiness and the people of Tibet in their quest for freedom? Although, since two years, I completely retired from political responsibility. Uh, not only myself retired, but also almost four century old tradition, the Dalai Lama Institution automatically become head of both temporal and spirituality. Now that ended. That system start during fifth Dalai Lama. So now suppose I'm 14th Dalai Lama, I voluntarily, happily, proudly ended that. So now we have uh, elected political leadership. So I think a precise answer, I think most probably from him right now is better. But in any way, my main concern is Tibetan uh, Buddhist tradition, which come from Nalanda tradition. I think, I think one of the, I think almost the best sort of institution through at least you see, several centuries, you see, uh, remain as a real learning center about Buddhist philosophy. So our tradition come from that. Uh, because the introducer, Buddha Dharma, in Tibet uh, was one of the top scholar of that institution, 8th century. He invited by Tibetan emperor. Uh, so uh, I really feel, as a result of meeting with many Buddhist brothers and sisters in, from Buddhist countries, different Buddhist countries, now I realize the Buddhist tradition which we carry is complete form. And also, we use a lot because of logical no. debate, dialectical debate. debate. So that's almost, I think, unique. So therefore, uh, I'm very much concerned about the preservation of Tibetan Buddha Dharma, 
on Buddhism and Buddhist culture. I usually make a distinction, Buddhism and Buddhist culture. Buddhism meant for individual. Buddhist culture related with community. One clear example is, uh, I think last four centuries, during fifth Dalai Lama, uh, Muslim community eventually you see, start. I think at least a few thousand Tibetan Muslims there. So these Muslim, religious faith, they are Muslim. But their way of life very much in the spirit of Buddhist culture. So that culture, I think, uh, usually I describe culture of nonviolence, culture of peace, culture of compassion. So therefore, that kind of culture is something really uh, useful for preserve. And particularly nowadays in China, China proper, Buddhist population now in China, uh, around 400 million. So you see China, the communist country, literally, yeah, yeah. literally communist country, but reality, <laughs> questionable. <laughs> so, so you see there, I think the biggest Buddhist population now in China, like that. So therefore, so therefore, preservation of Tibetan Buddhism also, you see, immense benefit to, to those Chinese Buddhists. Already, you see, many Chinese Buddhists already, you see, following Tibetan Buddhism, receiving teaching from some Buddhist master. And unfortunately, some false Buddhist master also now go there selling Dharma, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> So that's my main concern. Uh, I think uh, you, uh, whenever you find opportunity meeting with Chinese sort of brothers, sisters, whether politicians or whether sort of the officials or professors or students, I think share uh, the, the real picture of Tibet people, Tibetan culture, Tibetan history, share these people. They are completely ignorant because too much censorship. So that, I think, uh, already number of Chinese really showing us solidarity. One example, uh, last, I think, around three years, we noticed about 1,000 articles wrote by Chinese, uh, of course, including overseas Chinese, and also Chinese in, from mainland. All these about 1,000 articles, all fully support about our middle way approach, not seeking independence, but remain within the People's Republic of China and give us meaningful autonomy, which constitution provided us. That's right, that status. So, so you see those uh, thousand articles, uh, all thousand articles fully support about our middle wave approach, we call middle wave approach, not seeking independence, not seeking separation, but within the people's of China and a meaningful autonomy. So they fully support and very critical their own government policy regarding these minority people like that. So these are, uh, uh, I think, a clear sign, more awareness about the reality than, you see, they develop this kind of sort of opinion. This, this is very positive. As the things are being stated, seeking truth from fact is very scientific. So you see, there are no opportunity to to, 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 to get real information. So, outside, this is a better opportunity to educate them. What's the reality? Yes. That's, Thank I think, you. a practical way to help, help us.
Um, the next question is from Roshani from Oregon, asks, what is the most important thing a single individual can do to help repair the natural world and create a more sustainable way of living? Although these things real effect come from large scale or worldwide movement. movement yeah. But initiative must start from individual. So therefore, each of us is have so something to make a contribution or to show other people. And then here the or the concern about the environment. You see, sometimes violence, even one to show picture or starvation or malnutrition, through picture, we immediately feel, oh, very sad, we must do something. Very striking. Striking. Very striking. But environment damaging, not that kind of striking. Invisibly, right? Yeah. Gradually come. When we actually notice more coughing, or coughing, right? coughing, cough, and difficult to breathe, or some irritation, an eye, eyelid, right? the eyes, or eye, then maybe too late. So therefore, educate this importance of ecology. It's very, very important. Then there's some kind of preservation of the ecology, this should become part of our daily life. About drinking water and the preservation of electricity, all these things, you can make little contribution each day. I myself, of course, may be a bit silly. Whenever I leave my hotel room, I always put off light. Switch off. Switch off. Switch off. Uh, uh, then I never take bath in for the tape. Bath tub. Bath tub. Bath tub. Bath tub. Uh, only shower. But shower two times. One in the morning, one in the evening. So I'm wondering how much water take as a take, take compared a tape. to yeah. Compared to taking a bath in a bathtub versus two showers. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. Suppose I think less water in any way. <laughs> so now that become my habit. Uh, so then, uh, whenever I have the opportunity to talk, I always refer importance of ecology. So it become part of your daily life, like that. That's I feel. Then beside that, I don't know, you should ask those specialists much better. <laughs> Next question. I, I think my son would like to uh, conserve a little water with his own baths. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> Diane from Talent, Oregon asks, I do not want to deny and push away the painful problems of the world, but I also do not want to be overwhelmed by them. As we face our environmental and social crisis, how can we keep ourselves from sinking into sadness and despair? Now, regarding the problem, we must be realistic. Some problem, uh, there's very little sort of chance to overcome. Uh, some problem, I think most cases, I think there's a way to overcome. Even global level, I think many problem, I think ecology, complete sort of the safe world, I don't know, uh, uh, realistically speaking. Now already global warming and the world itself now moving 
difference of direction and uh, and uh, sort of about, uh, I think about a few centuries the position also is changing. Therefore, you see this uh, nature sort of disaster may. Oh, here, 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 here. Oh, uh, hello, hello, hello. <laughs> no, okay, okay. Okay, I would like to say hello. Now she does one. So, <laughs> so I think for me, it is really very helpful, one sort of advice or suggestion from one great Indian Buddhist philosopher in the 8th century. He mentioned when we face some problems, some tragedy, you must analyze the nature of that tragedy. If that tragedy can overcome, then don't worry, uh, don't feel sad, but make effort, try to overcome that. Full sort of enthusiasm, full sort of determination, a confidence. If the, uh, the tragedy, the situation is now uh, no way to overcome, then don't worry too much. Just you see, accept, you see, that tragedy. <laughs> no way to overcome that. I think that is very realistic. Now, instead of sort of, because of the Instead of persisting. Instead of persisting, try to some other things. That's better. Our brain is quite sort of capable. You see, one field of failure, no possibility to achieve that, then other, other thing we can do. So there are always there's different options, always there. So here also you see, I think this morning I mentioned attachment. Uh, problem, when someone you see involves certain works or certain things, too much attached, then Due to attachment, for the moment you feel this is the only thing. Uh, so, detach. Uh, then your mind becoming as a look, look, look at things right? more objective. Then you will find other options. That usually I do. Only one thing. See one thing, failure, then really hopeless. Because of that, completely lost hope, uh, demoralized. So this feel, this, uh, this particular thing failed, but other lot of other, other options there. 
then look there, try, make effort. I think that's, that's I think, human way. Animal, something, you see the obstacle, still go like that. That's the animal way. Yeah. Animal way, we human way. Smart brain, one way, other, try, try other, like that. <laughs> what do you think? Any sense? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> Next question now. Okay, this is the last question. It's a little similar, but Marta from California asks, the balance between wrathful compassion and anger is challenging when confronted with the current political environment. Sometimes our feelings of anger are motivated by our love and concern. How can you act powerfully without anger? Anger, uh, a certain sort of mental reaction. Uh, it could be different sort of motivate, sort of different causes. Uh, sometimes, as you just mentioned, out of sense of concern, sometimes anger comes. That anger is positive. So, under certain circumstances, more wrathful action, wrathful attitude is necessary in order to stop that dangerous thing, which is harmful to themselves also. So, uh, so these mental sort of thing, uh, see, very much. So, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, related with different motivation, no, different thought or different mind. So we cannot say uh, anger at all something ne negative. We can, we cannot say that. Anger, out of sort of ill feeling like that, it's really bad. But uh, anger, out of sense of concern, is positive. And then. Uh, these emotions must combine with our wisdom or intelli intellectual, intelligence, right? intelligence. Uh, then sometimes see, the negative emotion, destructive emotion, with help of intelligence can be positive, like that. That's our unique ability. Uh, and they say, like this sense of self, strong self, right? Or eco, egoistic sort of feeling. The just sort of importance of self, or strong sense of self, right? Or uh, which leads harm, harming other, cheating other, exploit other. That kind of egoistic view is negative. But another sort of strong sense of strong self is actually the basis of determination or willpower. Self-confidence is very important in order to extend the infinite love or compassion. Too much self-centered Equistic person, very difficult. Or oh, weak, weak eye, right. weak self. Weak self, difficult. So must be very courageous. Here, this sense of strong self is very positive. So, due to many other factors, right. you see, a certain emotion can be positive, useful, can be destructive, harmful, like that. So we need more knowledge, more study about world of emotion, map of emotion, map of mind is very important. So this, this, uh, this respect, I think ancient Indian sort of uh, tradition, Indian psychology, ancient Indian psychology, including Buddhist psychology, quite rich. Very detailed explanation. So that I think should not consider as a part of or 
Indian study or Buddhist study, but simply consider as an academic subject, isolate from religion, simply uh, st study of mind, mind, like that. I think very possible. So it is it's really worthwhile to think seriously. Good? Now okay. finished? Don't watch it. Okay. Thank you, Your Holiness, and thank you, Anthony. We'll see you in a little bit. Um, now, for the sake of transparency, uh, my TRIPA board member will report to His Holiness the two date accounting figures for the Dalai Lama Environmental Summit. Please welcome to the stage my TRIPA board member and treasurer, Scott South. Thank you, Darren. So it is customary to share the financial results of these events. Accordingly, I am pleased to announce that the total revenue for the University of Portland event on Thursday and this event at the Veterans Memorial Coliseum were approximately $850,000. And then there's always expenses. So the expenses for these events were approximately $550,000. And this results in the combined net surplus for both events of $300,000. If there are any surplus from events with featuring His Holiness, the surplus will be distributed to charitable distribution. For the surplus for this visit, 30% will be used to support the nonprofit educational programs at Matripa College. And 30% in consultation with the Office of Tibet in New York will be distributed to local and international charities. And, and the remaining balance will be spent on charitable programs as per direction and device of the Office of Tibet in New York, such programs may include education, health, social development, and other worthwhile programs. So this includes the financial report. So as our time with Her Holiness draws to a conclusion, I want to first thank Matripa College's staff, students, and volunteers and to thank the Rose Quarter staff and all the vendors and the City of Portland's police and State Department for the outstanding service. And then I'd also like to thank today's speakers and performers on stage today. And now, join me in thanking His Holiness for the shared wisdom and tireless energy of his visit in Oregon, and I must say this afternoon, for supporting the Portland Trailblazers. <laughs> first, first, everyone please stand calmly in a careful manner and present your wife's scarves, also known as kata, to His Holiness. Your Holiness, on behalf of Matripa College, the City of Portland, our community, and all here today, thank you for your simple yet profound words of inspiration and our, on our personal and universal responsibility to improve and protect our global environment, and also on our call for compassion. And thank you for visiting Port Oregon. We wish you goodwill and good health and please visit Portland again to share with us your insightful thoughts and warm heart. So, so as you drape, so as you drape the scarf over your neck, I would like to invite Yangtze Rinpoche, president of Matripa College, to stage. And please join me in thanking His Holiness, the Dalai Lama.
Thank you. Your wholeness, your tireless effort. We don't know how to express, we don't know which kind of word to choose, but we can see your compassion and your warm heart and your genuine human affection. In the same way, we all feel very inspir inspiration. We only feel, we don't know where to describe by word. And we really appreciate it. We feel appreciation, but we don't know where to describe by word. Nevertheless, thank you very much and have a very, very long life. And uh, we hope and pray that you will return to Tibet and meet all the Tibetans over there to have one more time to see your face and heard your teachings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, wait. I usually uh, explaining the scarf. Uh, this tradition come from India. They, when some important visitors, you see, visit some temples or like that, then they give you shawl. Uh, so the tradition come from India. Inspiration come from India. Then this material, in the past, nowadays, of course, produced in India also. In the, in the past, this material made in China under Tibetan instruction, therefore, Tibetan writing on it, hmm? some prayer, Tibetan script. So now that sort of tradition, we, you, we carry this tradition. So this shows unity, harmony, one thing. Then another thing, this material, very smooth. So that symbolizes our daily life must be very gentle, very smooth. And usually it's a white color. Now, except the yellow color, there also some significance about grow like that. The, usually it's a white color. You see, that shows pure heart. Pure, pure heart. So that's more sense of concern of others' well-being. It's the pure heart. So it is compulsory to keep this scarf. Uh, unity must be part of your life. Warm-heartedness must be part of your life. <laughs> Otherwise, you see, <laughs> carrying a scarf, meaningless. <laughs> then Rinpoche, uh, suppose his previous uh, uh, a reincarnation, or uh, just as an ordinary sort of scholar, or top scholar, really learned one. Uh, he passed away inside the bed. Then his concerns of the people, or his sort of students, you see, find this person. Uh, so very sincere, uh, a very nice person since his young age. I know him. Now differences now no longer. Uh, monk disrobed these both. Uh, both now, uh, they learned in the monastery. After they learned, now disrobe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank 
Where's the, the singer? Actually, we are the same human being. So I always mentioning mentally, emotionally, physically, we are the same. So the potential which I have and also use that potential, you also have the same potential. And now the question is, you must realize that potential and utilize that potential as much as you can. Then you will be a happy person and a successful life. So don't pay all your attention for dollar, dollar, dollar. <laughs> Think more about inner value. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. Well, thank you, and uh, I think now there's a short break, 15 minutes, and um, as you uh, get up and stretch your legs, don't forget to check out the Green Action Day booth for details on tomorrow's event at Portland Pioneer Courthouse, but I think I went out of order and I need to introduce you first, so please come on out. Thank you, sorry. Thanks. Just one brief uh, announcement. My name is Jim Blumenthal. I'm a professor at uh, Maitripa College in Oregon State University. And I just want to say, you all look, it's a spectacular vision to see 11,000 people with katas around their necks. Um, we wish to extend our deep thanks and gratitude once again to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and we sincerely hope that His Holiness will, has enjoyed his stay in Portland and that he'll return once again to the City of Roses quickly. We also want to remind you all of the final event of the four days dedicated to the environment hosted by Maitripa College. This will be the Green Action Day, a Mother's Day event for the Earth tomorrow, a call, a call to protect our planet for future generations. It'll take place in Pioneer Courthouse Square from noon to five o'clock. The intent is to take the inspiration from the past three days and put it into action. More than 15 regional environmental organizations with lots of suggestions for things that you can do will have booths set up. There'll be leading environmental speakers, top musical acts, and so forth. All the details are available on the uh, official event website. Come join us for the joyous and inspiring event hosted by Maitripa College. It's been an honor to be with you today. I hope that this is the beginning of a call to action for all of us as we commit to change for the, for the planet that we share and on which we all depend. Many thanks again, and enjoy the red hot chili peppers set, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. <laughs>